the world is teeming with complex interactions. From this everyday activity emerges larger patterns produced by complicated webs of interaction. Phenomena can emerge from physics, from the laws of physics and chemistry, which look very different from the usual physics and chemistry. Nevertheless, they've come out of it. For example, life. Many of the most interesting and challenging systems that we see around us are made up of a very, very large number of interacting components. In nature, we see self-organizing all the time. You know, we see beautiful flocking behavior in animals. Uh, we see crystal growth. We see um, the, the growth of natural structures. They all have order from just their internal dynamics. Many systems in nature are made of components that are connected or disconnected. In these systems, the pattern of connectivity can dramatically affect the system's properties. These systems of connectivity are called networks. So a network is a mathematical abstraction designed to capture the idea that in, in lots of systems, things are connected to other things. In terms of all of these complex phenomena that we talked about earlier, everything from financial markets to weather systems to biology to ecosystems and so on, is that networks play a fundamental role. Networks are made out of discrete nodes that are connected to one another via some relationship. Some connections are very strong, like the links between predator and prey. Others, less so. But in most systems, the pathways of interaction are crucial to the system behavior. The specifics of who can interact with whom affects the properties of the system and processes within. Complex networks are everywhere. A network of websites and hyperlinks forms the World Wide Web a vast and complex information network that is the backbone of the information age. Predator-prey interactions form an ecological network called a food web, the circuit diagram of an ecosystem. Complicated networks of human interaction form dynamic social webs, which are woven into the fabric of societies. In many ways you are nothing but um, a um, agglomeration of a whole bunch of networks, your know, circuitry system, your respiratory system, your renal system, your neural system, uh, your bones. There's networks of people spreading diseases, there's the network of associations you're having in your head right now as I'm talking, right? I mean, ideas are connected to other ideas. There's linguistic networks, there's, there's networks of pretty much anything you can think of from business to economics to social, social networks of people. All of these are examples of networks and these kinds of examples suggest why it's such a, a ubiquitous concept. Whenever there's a system of interacting objects where things are, are linked to other things, networks are a, are a useful abstraction for thinking about them. We want to predict how these networks will look like. That is, we want to go from the microscopic processes of what each node does or wants to do or can do and derive from that the large-scale properties of the network, how the network will look in the future, how does it look right now. Some properties of networks are system-specific. Others depend only on who is connected to whom, not on the details of the system. In recent years, network scientists have made advances in characterizing and modeling general and specific network features. But these systems are all very different. How can we hope to model the common features of such different and complex systems? Can we create a common language for their common structure? There are many different things that can be represented as sets of nodes joined together by edges or links. And 
this turns out to be a very useful abstraction of the sort of shape that these systems have. The networks seem pretty simple, but they're always very context dependent when you really have to think carefully. In the 1730s, Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler began thinking about how to express connectivity in mathematical terms. He was trying to prove an urban myth about his city of residence, Konigsberg, Prussia. Konigsberg has many rivers and islands, and bridges connecting the disjoint sections of town. The Prussians would often wonder, is it possible to take a route through town that crosses each bridge exactly once and return to the starting point? Euler addressed this question in a novel way. He observed that only connectivity mattered for the problem, so he abstracted away all other details. He contracted the landmasses to nodes and the paths to links between them, creating the first mathematical representation of connectivity called a graph. He used his new network model to prove that there was no closed path through Konigsberg. And this result is considered the birth of graph theory. There are actually a lot of very useful results that help us in the study of networks that come from traditional graph theory. I mean, they're very nice models that, um, depending on what the nodes are trying to do, will produce things remarkably like what you see in real life. Graphs are the basic representations of networks. They capture the structure common to network systems. Many kinds of graph models can be constructed to explain the general structure and formation of complex networks. Graph models can also be enriched with structural details to describe specific features of networked systems. In the following lesson, you'll learn about some of the properties of complex networks. You will also learn about the language of graph theory and how this language is used to describe the general structure and specific features of complex networks.